this conversation is going to be recorded so just so you guys know uh, so hello everyone and welcome to the live q a today with our special guest manuela savi manuela welcome <laughs> thank you renata it's great a long to time here. see you yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so today the topic is alpha like and we want to know everything about how did the company start like about the, your background or like the name uh and we're we're thrilled to be sharing this with all, all of you guys um so first as usual can you tell us where you're spending your not quarantine days but like your your pandemic uh and how is it going for you Sure, sure. So in the beginning of, of quarantine, I was actually in New York. Uh, I was in New York for a while. I actually got sick, was in my house for about five weeks without seeing another human, which was challenging. Let's put it that way. Uh, then during this process, I ended up moving to California, where I am now uh, in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, just enjoying having more space, outdoor area, and just, you know, the, the simple things in, in life. Uh, and really, really enjoying working from home. I feel like we do gain a lot of productivity, just not having to commute and being able to just sit down in your computer and get your day started. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, so let's go back in time now. Uh, can you tell us how everything started? Like where did this idea for this crazy company came from? Sure. Uh, so, you know, as some people know, I'm a finance background uh, and I worked in a big hedge fund in Brazil at the time. Uh, and I picked up a book called King of Oil, which is Mark Rich's biography. And Mark Rich is actually the guy that came up with the spot oil market. So looking at this, the oil market in the 60s, the formation of the market, how, you know, there were few players, almost like a cartel-like formation, and the art market uh, back then, there were so many similarities that, you know, I, I, I started thinking of what can be done to bring transparency to this market. And as I started to kind of like play around with, with different ideas, like how to democratize it, that's when we met and how the, the idea started transformed from, you know, a dream to a reality. To a reality. Yeah, I think I remember that. <laughs> I think I remember uh, it. <laughs> so, so what about the, the name? Like, uh, we used to be called Geração Alpha, and now it's Alpha A Inc. Or Alpha. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So once again, uh, the finance background was so strong, and I guess in, in me as a person. Uh, and uh, there's a concept in finance which is called to, to generate alpha, which basically means that on a regression, on a regression line, uh, you have the, the risk and return axis. And, uh, you know, the, the alpha is really the outlier in that line, which means the person with the same level of risk that generates a superior return. This concept is really, really covered by Malcolm Gladwell in that book, Outliers, which talks about different tools by which people become these magical people that are, you know, just out of the line, as we mentioned. And that was always the objective of Alpha, to generate Alpha for all of the participants involved, for the artist, for the collector, uh, and, you know, for now for the institutions as well, to create a product which was virtually open uh, accessible for everyone, pricing-wise and uh, just culturally as well. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so, but like, what happened from Jerusalem Ger Alpha to Alpha A Inc? Like, how how did this name change and why? So, you know, we were bringing the company to the U.S. and obviously Gerasal Alpha was not going to work. It wasn't the most universal name. So we went through a naming process where I actually wanted the company to be called Two, <laughs> which was the second version of Gerasal Alpha. And as you recall, you were very, very against <laughs> this new name too. Thank God you were so against it. Uh, and uh, we made a bet that if we kept the Alpha in the name, 
you would get a tattoo of the album. Yeah. <laughs> which I actually which have I one. Which I did. <laughs> And I have one as well, like in, in my leg. So we became matching alphas, I guess, for life now. Yeah, um, I remember at that time, people were like making fun of us and, and then saying that like your first year is you had to get a tattoo, like, and we both had a tattoo already. Um, so that, that shows the level of commitment for sure. But uh, you, you briefly touched upon that, but like, can, you, can you talk a lot a little bit more about how did the founders meet. So for those who don't know, besides from Manuela and myself, we also have a technical founder who doesn't like the camera much, uh, Aro Luchinoko, who has been with us pretty much since the beginning. So yeah, I feel like our meeting was really, really funny. Uh, we have to start there to kind of like build our way out. Uh, in 2014, I was launching the MVP of the platform in Art Rio, and it was, you know, everybody thought we were just a t-shirt company because we were selling t-shirts to raise funds for a scholarship initiative. And a friend of mine emailed me and said, I have this friend, she works in the arts, she's coming to Brazil, can you show her, you know, a little bit of the market? And I said, of course, like, uh, send her my information. Uh, and she ended up coming, and the friend was Renata. The friend was <laughs> the friend was Renata, and, and it was so funny because this was like real forty degrees Celsius weather. We were in the sun, and you know we were all in like shorts and a t-shirt. And Renata shows up in a full-on suit, <laughs> wearing a blazer, like so proper. And we were like, "Who is this girl?" Okay, She's so serious. <laughs> Uh, and after that, you know, we just started talking and 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 exchanging uh, ideas about how we thought the market should organize themselves itself. And we ended up going to Miami together, uh, and uh, we had a full week to not only explore the arts but to see how much we we thought similarly, which at the time was so different from the rest of the market. We felt like the art market should be open. We felt like there should be transparency. We felt like there should be a lot more opportunity. Uh, and it was just immediate from there. Renata just packed up her belongings and, and moved to Rio and the rest is history. And then we both got in a plane, went to some that, my friends, you can call the big leap of faith. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, and we went to Sao Paulo, where her parents lived. I remember I stayed in her house and everything to interview this developer that, you know, we thought was kind of interesting. Uh, he, he, he agreed with us. He was actually the vice president of the Interior Designer Association as well of Sao Paulo. So he had an eye for design. Uh, and it was also, I feel like, you know, in these, when you start a company, there's just moments where you enter collective flow and you meet people that are inside the same mind state. And I think the three of us really had that immediate connection where we knew we needed to work together and we made it work. We, we all made sacrifices. We all took really low pay or no pay for a long time and we got the product off the market and off the ground and into the market. Yeah, that was actually going to be my next question, but I guess you just answer that like some of the reasons why uh the founders work well you know because like sometimes like you can have complementary skills but like you you don't have the same core values like or have the same core values or skills don't don't go well together but like in your in your opinion what is it that like was the secret for for our crazy like i don't know uh collaboration <laughs> I feel like being, yeah, no, I feel like being different was the number one thing. You need different mindsets and you need different cultures in order to come at a problem in a, in a complete way. Uh, for anyone that knows us, that we're like yin and yang. Uh, I'm, you know, extremely rational and like I overthink everything a million times, but at the same time, I'm super spontaneous and like wanting to put things out. And Renata's like super emotional, but at the same time, she's like super careful about what she wants to put into the world. And so we kind of like pushed ourselves in the in in the best way possible. And um, Aroldo, on the other hand, is practical, but at the same time, you know, he's a dreamer. 
Uh, so we were three different people in, in three very different ways. And I feel like our shortcomings were, were just available in the, the other person's biggest qualities. So we're very, very lucky to have like found such a complimentary founding team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Don't cry. So, Don't cry. <laughs> Everyone knows that being an entrepreneur is it's a hard choice uh, and especially being an entrepreneur, a female entrepreneur. So can you share some of like your biggest obstacles to date uh, and maybe give us a little bit of color by telling a story? Sure. So firstly, we are in a very small group of female founders that have raised outside capital and that have raised a sus substantial amount of outside capital. Uh, just looking at, you know, the numbers, 0.2% of venture capital dollars go to Latin founders, Latin female founders. So we're already in that 0.2% group. And uh, there have been so many challenges that we'd have to overcome. I remember specifically one meeting with one investor in San Francisco that was actually put together by another one of our investors. And the guy just wanted to make me cry. His objective was not to understand the business. His objective was to make a girl cry. And talking to a lot of different female founders, and there have been a number of other experiences. I actually write about a lot of them have a little blog on, on Medium. Uh, there's been a guy in LinkedIn saying, commenting on, on one of my posts saying that women should work in the household because their brains are less developed than men. There's been another guy basically saying that your two, two choices were to have babies or you know something else just as ridiculous. And you just have to put on your thick skin and, and understand that you know it's their shortcomings and it's their insecurity and that women do make better founders. The statistics speak for it. Uh, mm -hmm. We're, you know, 30% more likely to have a profitable business. Uh, we're, you know, we, we hustle much, much harder. And I feel like we've found some amazing investors along the way. I feel like New Age Capital needs to be mentioned here that mm -hmm. have the impetus of really supporting the minorities because the minorities will work much harder. We just have to work much harder and we just have to prove a lot more traction before anyone gives us anything, which just means we're gonna build a better business. There's, you know, there's a number of stories and we could sp spend a lot of time on this subject, but my advice for any female founder out there that you know, might be watching this is don't give up and build a business and let the numbers speak for themselves because you know, it's not about building it and they will come. It's about building that traction and then the investors will come basically. So when did you know that it wanted to become an entrepreneur like and found this company? Like, and what was the reason why you decided to do it? So I feel like this question is, it's, it's a little charged. Uh, you should never start a company unless you absolutely have to. Like, I feel like inside me, I had to, to found this company. I grew up in the arts with a dad as an art dealer. My mom is an, an artist, uncle is an art advisor, and so it goes. And when I was very young at 17, I worked with my dad at the gallery for a couple of years because he had just had a heart attack. And I feel like the market was what made it most interesting for me then. I remember I wrote a massive paper like when I, at, at 17 about how to create more transparency in Latin in the Latin American art market because it just seemed like a little bit of a, a club that you'd have to be part of. You'd have to have money to join. You'd have to have the right connections. And it was just so exclusive in every way towards the artists, towards new collectors, towards people that might just be remotely interested in the arts. And that kind of like just stayed at the back of my head. I went off to do my thing, went off to work in finance, but that little bug never left. And then at one point it was just stronger than, than me. Uh, and I had to make the move, but it's not an easy road. I feel like even in finance where, you know, you have these crazy hours and this crazy routine, you have a much more stable life than the life of, you know, what we, what we're going through. I'm sure, you know, once we do your interview, you have a lot of 
different stories as well to share about you know how hard it is it's not an easy road period no i agree it has to be something beyond the payment beyond the like it it's it it's something that you have to do like you can go through your life without trying that um so now let's go for like more like uh fun stories like or like i don't know like from all of those years working together like uh, almost six years of alpha can you talk about like one or maybe two of your favorite moments the like, highlights there's so many but i i've uh, i felt like I, I was reading elon musk's bio and his brother is co his co-founder in all of his companies nobody really knows that but they're best friends and they do a lot of like stuff on the side. They go to Burning Man, they ride mountain bikes, et cetera. And I remember I, I, I related a lot because I think what really made us special as well was that we not only went through our professional challenges together, but we, we built this kind of like whole world on the side as well. And I think sports were, were a big part of it. Uh, I think, you know, there was one specific day where we just, I, I was talking to someone about this story the other day and I just kept laughing. When we decided to, to ride a bicycle to Storm King, <laughs> the outdoor installation center, and we messed up the route and we ended up on this massive highway, climbing a hill, which was super steep. And we were both in silence because we knew we were like in such danger. We didn't want to talk about it. Then this van came by and, and I remember like there was dust that was lifted off my shoulder. That's how close the guy came by. And we both just yeah. started laughing and said, Alpha almost went extinct. Mm -hmm. That was one of the funniest moments I think of like my life. It was like a, a punch in the air. Like, like the, the van just was so close by that like you could feel, you know, like the the are and the air moving. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that well. Like, we, my yeah. reason for not being speaking is like one, I was petrified. Two, I was so angry at you who was leading the way. <laughs> but I think like if I spoke out, I, I wasn't gonna say anything very nice. <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but when we got to Storm King, it was so great. Remember, like we just sat there for a little bit and kind of like took that in and. I feel like sports and entrepreneurship, especially endurance sports, they go so well hand in hand because it really is about the journey. It's about resilience. It's about not taking no. And it's about understanding that it's always about a mindset. It's about a mindset of not giving up. And uh, I think we we couldn't have done everything that we we did, especially that summer of six moves in New York when we were waiting for funding. Uh, without the sports element. It was such an important, yeah. not only bonding experience, but escape channel for all of the frustrations that, you know, we're building in the professional life. I agree. It was my first time doing sports in my life. <laughs> and I have to thank that to Manuela like, and her family who really like, pushed me into this path. Uh, it's, it's really a great thing to have in your life. Um, okay, so like maybe like something more specific to work now, like like one of your favorite projects. Um, I don't know, like I, I know that there are some that speak to your heart more, uh, but like maybe let's see what I have in mind, like if it's, it's the same. <laughs> I have to say that right now I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled about the path that we're taking with the platform. I'm thrilled that, you know, we brought in this amazing uh, mentor which we can, shall not mention the name, but has been, finally we're able to do the UX and UI redesign of the platform that we've been building up for the past five years. And I feel like the product now is finally gonna reflect everything that's been in our minds. And, and, and to see it come to life, to see all of this, these really neat technological features that we've always talked about, the augmented reality stuff, the blockchain platform, which was a baby of mine as well. And that I kind of like fought a little bit to, to have it on the platform because, you know, authentication was always an important part of the journey. And to see all of this 
like I, I was presenting uh, the, the platform the other day to, to two friends. One of them was a UX UI designer at, at, at Apple and the other one was a UX UI designer at Instagram. So they, they know their stuff. And I was just showing them the different features and showing them the back end and the CMS and showing them how, you know, the authentication works and showing them the artworks and showing them like just the full product. And they were like, well done. This is a really, really robust platform. And that was a very, very proud moment because we know how much it takes to build a technology company. And we know how much it takes to build a technology company in the arts which is the least technological market that there is out there. And uh, I'm just so very, very, very proud of what we're putting together as a team. And, you know, it, the company, it, and I feel like maybe we defer there. Uh, you're more the dreamer and I'm more the practical part. But to see the company have a life of its own that doesn't rely on us as individuals, that's my proudest moment. No, sounds great. Um, so maybe continue on that path of like looking ahead. How do you see the future developing for Alpha and yourself? Ah, uh, there's so much. Uh, but my, I really do want every building in the world to have Alpha artworks in their common areas. Uh, I see the the augmented reality and virtual reality integration as a, a massive next step. Uh, just bringing in this personalized content by the artists to within the buildings, humanizing these buildings, uh, using technology to leverage their, com their connection to the local communities, bringing in these stories to passerby, just, you know, really improving how people interact with common spaces. There's so much potential and uh, I feel like we're only touching the tip of the iceberg. I really do think we can see Alpha in most of the commercial and residential buildings in, in North America in the next five years. Always thinking yes. small. Always <laughs> thinking small. <laughs> Always thinking, thinking small. But this is one thing that I, I think I kind of learned or I'm still learning from you. Like always to be optimistic about uh, the future, the present and the future. And uh, yeah, like that's, that's not for everyone. Yeah, George Paulo Lemon has a great phrase. George Paulo Lemon is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world, not just Brazil. This guy is amazing what he's done with his trajectory and, and his dream was always to buy an Hauser Bush, by the way, like, and he, he and which he did, which is now a Brazilian company. Uh, but he used to say that dreaming big and dreaming small cost the same thing. So dream big. Yeah. And the higher you aim, the higher they get. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, anything else you'd like to share with, with our audience today? Like, like any like relevant uh, comments or like stories that like we haven't covered? There's so many. Uh, but I feel like the, the, the biggest one is we, we couldn't have done this without our artists. Our artists are the backbone of this community. Uh, and if you're an artist, please continue to submit works, continue to participate, sign up for a webinar. We want to get your story out there because without the artists, there would be no platform. Yes, please <laughs> join <laughs> us in this revolution <laughs> always. <laughs> Um, so this, this has been an unusual and crazy year with a lot of ups and downs. Uh, and I think like now is like the more like quick answer questions. So can you talk about some of the things that kept you sane? Um, like maybe a book you've read, like a movie or TV series, uh, or like, like off the, off the different things or like an activity. Like if you want to share like one of our each, that's great too. So one, cycling, see the bikes here? <laughs> cycling has been, uh, I feel like it's one of my favorite things to do. And uh, I wasn't that connected to it before, but now, you know, I've just been cycling so much, like, and going so far. And movement is very therapeutic and it helps me think a lot and it helps me, you know, think of, of the things that I wanna do, the challenges that I have in professional and personal life. Uh, so that's been a, a fantastic grounding mechanism. Uh, the other thing is I'm reading, uh, well, finishing finally. I, I did a course at 
at Stanford, which was amazing. Uh, Scaling Up Excellence was the name of the book. I finished that. Uh, and now I'm, I'm back to reading a little bit more Gladwell, which has to be one of my favorite authors, a book called Talking to Strangers, which is about great miscommunications throughout history. Uh, so it's, it's really amazing to see how we are our optimists. Human beings are optimists. We tend to believe that people are telling the truth. So a great lesson there. Uh, and finally, Handmaid's Tale as a TV show. If you haven't seen it, watch it because we're so close to the tipping point and we don't even know it. And so we have to be alert. Uh, it's the, the, the tale of the toad in boiling water. If you put the toad into the boiling water, they'll immediately jump. But if you warm the water gradually, you'll boil yourself to death. And nobody here wants to be the toad. We live in, tr in, in, in trying times. In most of our countries, the political atmosphere is very, very complicated. So we have to be alert about you know, what we can do to avoid becoming the toad. Sounds good. Very positive. <laughs> <laughs> I may or may not be watching that. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> We have very different tastes for like a lot of things. <laughs> okay, uh, so any questions from, from our audience or we're gonna wrap it up? I feel like the audience is shy. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> the audience is shy. Se tiver alguma pergunta, pode fazer. Se não, até a semana que vem. <laughs> Acho que até a semana que vem. <laughs> ok. So, thank you so much, Manuela. It has been a pleasure. Uh, and uh, it's, it's great to be able to share uh, your story, our story, uh, with everyone else. Uh, stay tuned. There is a lot more to come. And in a couple of weeks, Manuela is going to be interviewing me. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to be able to see the other side of the, this coin. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye.